Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, for worship here uh, in person uh, at Grace Alliance Chapel, but then also those of you who are watching with us online. It is a blessing to have you join us tonight. As you are preparing for worship, uh, we will be closing worship tonight with Psalm 99. And so if you have your Bible or your Bible app, if you'd prepare yourself uh, for us to read Psalm 99 together as we close our time of worship. If you'd stand with me, we will just begin tonight with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy and the promise that they will follow us all the days of our lives. Thank you that you come close to us, that you have chosen to seek after us. Thank you that even when we were far from you, you have not been far from us. Lord, tonight as we seek your face, I pray that we would open our hearts and our minds and that we would let you have your way in us, whatever that is. Father, tonight we hold nothing back, we close nothing off, but we ask you, search us and know our hearts. Trust, try us, test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in us tonight, Lord, and lead us in the way of everlasting. Our heart's desire is not just to know you, but to be known by you. And so we just ask tonight, have your way. Do whatever it is that you desire to do. We hold nothing back from you tonight, God. 
receive not only our attention and our affection, but search your place in our hearts until all that remains is a love for you and a surrender to whatever your will may be. We love you and we trust you. Be glorified in Jesus' name.
99 says the Lord reigns let the peoples tremble he dwells between the cherubim let the earth be moved 
The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests and Samuel among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance he gave them. You answered them, O Lord our God. You were to them God who forgives, though you took vengeance on their deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Father, we thank you tonight that you, your son, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you today that you are holy that you are none other, that you are like none other, that you are set apart, that you are high above. But I thank you that your holiness does not keep you from us, but it is actually what you use to drive us to you. And so I pray tonight that your holiness would overwhelm each and every one of us, that we would see you as unlike every other, that we would know that nothing compares to you, that you stand alone, that you are God and there is none other. I pray tonight that we would allow you to search our hearts and our lives, even the culture and the world we live in, and that we would see once again that God is holy. And I pray that we would not, we would not allow ourselves to seek anything less than your holiness. I pray, God, that you would speak to us through your word and by your spirit and that you would drive every unholy thing from our lives, from the way we behave, from the way we speak, from the way we think, from the way we think about one another. May everything about us be like you. And so we ask you again, conform us to the image of the Son. Transform us that we would be not conformed to the image of this world any longer, but we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds until we look like Jesus. Make us the people of God. Not just who have been saved from their sin, but who have been removed from their sin and who have become the righteousness of God. Mold us and shape us. Don't just forgive us. Cleanse all of our unrighteousness. God, tonight I pray for me and I pray for all of my friends. Have your way. Refine us. Turn up the heat upon us until we let go of everything that's not of you. Forgive us for anything we have clung to and have your way in it. Take it from us. Heal us where we need to be healed. Rebuke us where we need to be rebuked. Teach us where we need to be taught. But just have your way in us until you've made us like you. And finally, God, I just ask you to forgive us for being willing to be less than what we were created to be. Forgive us for making room for the flesh. Forgive us for leaning on the things that make us comfortable or the things we see all around us. And as you are giving us forgiveness, give us the faith to be changed. The courage to be different. The longing to be like our Father. We love you. We trust you. We need you. Have your way and be pleased and be glorified in us tonight. Could we close worship by just singing that last chorus again? I want to be tried by fire. I want to be tried by fire. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Just invite him. Just invite him to test you and try you, to cleanse you. Sing that again.
Father, whatever you want to take and whatever you want to impart, have your way tonight. Our hearts are open, our minds are open, our lives are open. We hold nothing for our own. We belong to you. Have your way, whatever your way may be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. ask David to come and uh, lead us in our intercession. David, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for our intercession this evening, um, I'm going to go to uh, Psalm 103. Um, this uh, Some actually, uh, I had a chance to uh, read it again this week, and it took me back uh, to my years uh, in Congo. Um, uh, uh, let, let's read it. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. I thought about... Um, this chapter this week, uh, because I woke up actually early uh, as usual on uh, Thursday uh, for Thanksgiving and uh, wanted to pray, but for some reason I did not feel it, you know, feel like praying at all. So I was like, okay, let me go uh, just read, read uh, the Psalms. And um, I started again at 100 and then started going and then uh, arrived to this one here. And I was like, oh, I wonder why am I, you know, stuck with this one? Because I, I read it, you know, so many times and I listened to it. I, you know, went through different translations and I was like, why? And all, all of a sudden it dawned on me that actually the way I usually pray uh, every morning or every day actually came from this chapter. And that brought me back, as I was saying, to my years in, in Congo, because I remember uh, our uh, youth pastor would make us, we would go on retreats, um, uh, and he would make us just thank God an entire day in prayer. Okay. Nothing else. Okay. Don't, don't request anything. Don't pray for healing. Don't pray for deliverance. Don't pray for nothing but thank God for all that he has done already in your life. And I, I love this part because David makes it so clear that when, as you're blessing the Lord, as you're thanking the Lord, forgive nothing. Do not forget it, okay? Do not forget. Forget nothing. Forget not all of his benefits. There is always something wrong, you know, with us because, and that's a reminder that we are human beings. Uh, physically, uh, there is always something that does not work. Uh, the older you're getting, for you younger ones, you, you're going to realize it that something always falls apart. Um, uh, we, we all have issues. Uh, no matter where you are in your spiritual walk, we all have issues. We can spend hours and hours praying for healings, praying for deliverance, praying for so many things. 
But at the same time, God is reminding us that, yes, he has done way more than we can think or imagine. We can be those who are depressed, uh, thinking always, chasing, you know, the American dream, chasing, you know, healing, chasing deliverance, chasing something while we already have the best thing ever, okay? While we already have um, what God has done for us. Um, and, and just think of it if we sit here and start thanking God for every single part of, your, of our bodies. Okay. Yes, it can take you literally 24 hours just thanking God for every single part of your body. And yet we take it for granted. Thank God that I'm alive. That's how we pray. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that I am alive. You know how many billions of parts you're forgetting? Just to say thank you to God. And, and that's really the mindset that I want us to go into in prayer uh, this evening. Um, and that's the source. To me, I strongly believe that that's the source of, you know, joy as Christians, even happiness as Christians, by being thankful for everything that God has already done, not what he will do tomorrow, not what he is doing, but what he has already done in your life, who you are, just by who you are and being alive right now, what God has done is way more than you can think or imagine. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, um, you are worthy to be blessed. You are worthy to be lifted, worthy to be exalted, worthy. Who are we that you can even think of us? We are nothing but dust. But yet, here we are, gather in this place in your name. Here we are, gather in this place because you gave us life. Because we are walking, we are thinking, we are uh, talking, we are feeling, we are moving. And all of that is because of you. So thank you for all the great things, the awesome things that you have done within our lives, for all that you continue to do within our lives. We come before you as we are right now, yes, with our physical bodies, we come to bless you. With our souls, we come to bless you. With our spirit, we come to bless you. With the grace to be in this place, the place to, the, the grace to be in your presence, we say thank you to you. We can think of so many ways where we need your intervention. We can think of so many ways where we would love for you to intervene and to bring healing and to bring deliverance and to bring salvation. We can think of so many ways, but let us dwell on what you have done. Open our eyes to be able to see what you are doing. You are doing amazing things. You are doing wonderful things. You are doing great things within us, and you've already done it. So thank you for this place. Thank you for this church. Thank you for everyone who is present in this place. Thank you for those who are watching. Thank you for those who will be watching. Thank you for your work in this place. And thank you for your word. Thank you for the leadership. Thank you for making us a body. Thank you for bringing us all together so that we can work for your glory, so that we can lift you up, so that we can bless you, so that we can surrender before you. Thank you because you are the one stirring our hearts. Thank you because you are the one bringing 
your presence in us. Invading our lives with your presence. We thank you for your work in us. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for all the benefits that we get to enjoy every single day. You are God and you are worthy of it all. So we say thank you, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you haven't gotten a copy of uh, Connected yet, for those that are here with us, please get one before you leave. Um, the foyer is set up a little bit different um, right now with the Christmas decorations. Um, everything you need is over on the side um, where that island is. Um, but just a few announcements that I want to go over. Um, this Wednesday night is the next Revelation Bible study. Um, we'll be studying together Revelation chapter 11, verse 12, going through the end of the chapter, um, the resurrection of the two witnesses, and we will be on Facebook Live um, at 7 o'clock. Then this coming Saturday, I started making that announcement before I realized what it was. Um, the, this coming Saturday, uh, I'm doing a book signing um, at uh, Rose of Sharon Christian Bookstore in, um, in Burlington. Um, that is from, from 1 to 3. So if you have a book and you'd like it signed, um, more than likely if you have one, I signed it already. But if you have a book and you'd like it signed, please feel free to drop by. Um, as you know, I am really uncomfortable and awkward with all of this, but um, it's something that my wife said I had to do, and that uh, Miss Sharon said I had to do, and David said I had to do, and so I'm, uh, somehow I'm getting better at taking orders um, from those that God has surrounded me with. So um, the book has been so much fun and has been such a blessing um, just to see what God's been doing with it, and it's been so much more than I ever um, thought that it would be, and so um, I'm just looking forward, honestly, as awkward as I feel about it, I am looking forward to that couple of hours to see some faces and just to really to celebrate um, this gift that God's given me and that somehow he's using to bless others. So um, please be sure to uh, come out if you'd like to come out. I appreciate all the support that you guys have given already. And then finally, on Friday, December the 11th, um, there is a women's meeting that is a combination between Grace and City of Refuge. It is going to be a combined thing happening here in person and online as well so that all the ladies that are interested can be involved no matter how they want to be involved. Please be sure to just read that information. Um, see Melissa if you have any questions and spread the word to any of the women um, in your life. Um, I, I, I've already heard a lot about it and I'm looking forward to seeing what God will do with it. With that, if you would turn in your Bibles to John uh, chapter 19. Um, we are going to finish chapter 19 tonight and move into chapter 20 as well. So I guess the last announcement I'll do as you guys are turning it there is some of you may have noticed my sweatshirt tonight. Um, so <laughs> so um, the sweatshirt is the new logo um, for City of Refuge. Um, our friend Roger, who actually designed the logo, um, he has a, on his website, he does a lot of products. And so I asked him to make this one for me. Um, and only make one for me, partly to drive Amanda crazy um, when she saw me wearing it and didn't have one her, of her own, and it worked beautifully. Um, and so, but um, I, honestly, I didn't want to go have a whole bunch of them made or do something like that. But if you would like one, if it's something you're interested in, just let me know. And what we'll do is we'll just set up a store through Roger so that you can just order them there. So it's not us, you know, trying to sell wares and stuff like that at church, but you can go online and you can order whatever you want. Um, if you're interested in doing the same thing with t-shirts or something like that, um, you just let me know and we'll work with Roger and have the whole thing set up. So um, I kind of wanted to do this because I didn't want to push them on anybody. Like, I didn't want to buy a bunch of them and say, hey, you guys, come buy these. But I got to be really honest tonight. I also wanted to drive Amanda just a little bit crazy um, because Amanda has always made City of Refuge gear before anybody else. She made her own. So I figured, you know what? I'm going to make my own and let her, um, you know, let her stew in it a little bit. And the best part about tonight was she came walking in and she said, I like your shoes. And then she looked up and goes, what's that? And, uh, and, then, and then she just painted 
paced around a lot going, what, 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 why don't I have one? Why didn't I know about this? What? <laughs> so, um, you know, if you, if you want to know what really makes me happy, um, just uh, see if you can get Amanda spinning like a top a little bit, and, um, and it, 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 it just satisfies my soul somehow. So, Amanda, thank you so much. Uh, I love you. <laughs> So, John chapter 19, um, this is a long passage to read tonight, but I'm going to ask you to stand with, with me um, as we read together. John chapter 19. And Dank, when we're done reading, would you go turn that heat off? Because um, I don't know if it's hot for anybody else, but it's hot for me, and um, we won't be here that long. Um, so, John chapter 19, let's start reading in verse 38. It says, after this, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple... Of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Chapter 20. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that a stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she went, she, as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you that it is true. We thank you that it is sure, and we thank you that it has been given to us. Holy Spirit, tonight I pray that you would anoint us to receive from your word in the exact same way that you anointed the men who wrote this word. May we hear from you, may we listen to you, and may we go and obey you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Two weeks ago... We talked about the death of Jesus. And to the naked eye, Jesus' death was the outcome of arrogant and jealous religious leaders, a weak politician, and a broken system. 
Without knowing who Jesus was, how Jesus lived, and the things that Jesus said, his story might just be one of more injustice. But when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, when we believe that he lived perfectly to fulfill the law, and when we believe that he said without any reservation that his life would not be taken from him, but he would lay it down for us, we begin to see that the death of Jesus was not an injustice, but rather it was the greatest act of justice in the history of the world. That something was given that was not deserved. That something that was broken was made right. That something that could not be fixed was somehow made whole. See, justice is the correction of injustice. It is the outcome of righteousness. It is the restoration of equity. Justice happens when someone loves others more than they love themselves. Justice happens when someone freely gives to others because they believe that they have freely received from God. Justice happens when corporate good outweighs personal loss or personal gain. Here is how eternal justice, heavenly justice, was defined by Scripture and how it was displayed for all of the world to see. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus himself said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And so what justice looks like is the one who never sinned bearing the burden of all of us sinners. What justice looks like is for the one who had no price to pay to pay the price of all of those who had nothing to pay the price with. When Jesus said, it is finished, the injustice of sin was broken and the justice of heaven was applied. When sin was heaped on Jesus, righteousness was poured out to us. His death didn't only pay our ransom, it promised and provided us with new life. Don't ever forget that when Jesus said, it is finished, he was also saying that something new had begun. When old things pass away, all things become new. See, the cross is the place of endings and beginnings. It is where one man laid down in death so that all men could rise up into a new life. It is not the place of injustice. It is the place where justice should be defined. And that's hard for us as a culture, right? Because we keep looking around in the culture and we keep letting the culture define justice for us when the reality is all justice has to be defined by the cross. If it's not defined by the cross, then what is it defined by? How can broken men bring justice when all they have to offer is brokenness? And so the reality is there is no justice without the cross. There is no justice without Jesus. There is no justice without salvation and transformation. And so it's not just fixing a broken system so it's a little less broken. It's actually seeing transformation. And the only way transformation comes, and that is through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There can be no justice without the cross. There can be no justice without Jesus. Tonight we're going to linger at the cross for just a few more moments. But then we are going to move from the cross into the new life that is not only promised, but has already been provided. And that's what I want to tell you before we even get into this tonight. A new life has already been given to you. There is a new life that has been prepared, that has been provided, that is waiting for you and I to walk into it. You don't have to do anything to get new life because new life has already been made. It's a matter of if we will live the life that's been given for us. And so new life is not dependent upon Jesus coming and doing something for us. It is dependent upon us believing in what Jesus has already done enough to go live in it rather than just talk about it or wait for it. After the Roman soldier plunged his spear into Jesus' side and it was made obvious by the flowing of blood and water that he was dead, John tells us that a man named Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea went and asked Pilate if he could have Jesus' body for burial. Joseph is an interesting but sometimes overlooked character in the story of Christ. Matthew 27 verse 57 says that Joseph was a rich man. Mark chapter 15 verse 43 says that Joseph was a prominent or respected member of the council, which is also called the Sanhedrin. But John only tells us this. Joseph was a secret disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews. 
Joseph was a man of great wealth, great reputation, great authority, and great fear. But he wasn't alone in that place. John tells us that there also was a man named Nicodemus, who was another member of the council, who joined Joseph in taking Jesus' body from the cross and preparing him for burial. Nicodemus, you probably remember, you know that name. He came to Jesus under cover of night, near the beginning of Jesus' ministry in John chapter 3, saying, Jesus, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. But we never hear from him again. In fact, the last thing Nicodemus says is, how can a man, once he is born, return to his mother's womb? Basically, Jesus says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's the last time we hear from Nicodemus until the death of Jesus. And so what we see is that Nicodemus and Joseph had something in common. They believed enough to be present at the cross, even though they had not been moved enough to make their faith known. John says in verse 12, chapter 12, verse 42, that these two men were not alone. It says many, even of the authorities, believed in Jesus. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. See, history tells us that there were 71 members of the Sanhedrin. And so as we take one quick step back into the trial of Jesus, have you ever thought about the fact that there were men who believed in Jesus among the group that was deciding to kill Jesus? Imagine what that wrestling was like for Nicodemus, for Joseph, for these other leaders that, that uh, John talks about in John 12, 42. That as this decision is being made, they are sitting there doing everything in their power to try to sway it, but still so afraid that they can't announce their own loyalty but they won't announce that they have made a decision that they have believed in Jesus see these men believed in Jesus but they couldn't speak up for him because they were still bound by fear of what might happen to them and isn't that where we struggle the most in our walk of faith that we're not, we, we believe in Jesus. We believe in him. We, we believe in him with our whole heart. Ask me. If I know that you know, then I'll tell you what I know. But the moment we start worrying about what will happen to us, what will happen to me if I take a step of faith? What will happen to me if I start telling my family the truth? What will happen to me if I quit my job? What will happen to me if I move into this or if I start doing this? That is the fear that keeps us from obedience it's not the fear of what other people think it's the fear of what their thoughts will cause us fear of what would happen to us how often do we give more room to fear than we give to faith how often do we let the loudest voice get the majority of our attention how often do we chat with our fears when we should be declaring our faith John tells us clearly that Joseph believed in Jesus, that he was Jesus' disciple, but he also says that he lived in fear of the Jews. Faith and fear can occupy the same heart. We've talked about this many times, but I think it needs to continue to be talked about because too many of us have been condemned by our fear when the reality is faith and fear are often present in the same place. The question is, which one determines how we live, what we believe, and who we trust? It's not a sin to have fear. But fear will lead us into sin. And I think that's where we have to start dealing more honestly with ourselves. Because a lot of us think that the fear is the wrong, is the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is not ex announcing it, exposing it, and dealing with it. Being afraid does not mean we don't have faith. It means that we must choose faith again. We must declare faith a little bit louder. We must begin taking the scary steps of faith. Because in my life, what I've learned is that faith doesn't chase away fear. It pushes us to do what is necessary in the face of fear. Wouldn't it be easy of just saying, Jesus, I believe in you, made everything else just better. But believing in Jesus is supposed to be what motivates us to push through the hard stuff, to push through the fear, to push through the other opinions, to push through the anxiety, to push through all the stuff that we are afraid of, that we don't set it aside, but we march through it because I trust that he will keep me. And yet we keep espousing a gospel that tells people, just believe and you'll feel better. Guys, you might never feel better. But if you believe, you'll do what you're called to do. 
It's not about feeling better in the situation. It's about being obedient to the situation, doing the hard things, doing the difficult things, doing the faithful things, even though all I feel is the fear that's going on inside of me. And I love this passage of Scripture. Two men who have been living in fear suddenly choose faith. In fact, Mark 15, 43 says that Joseph took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Joseph was bound by fear until he got to Jesus' cross. Man, this, listen to me uh, for a couple of minutes tonight. When Jesus said it is finished, Joseph decided his fear was done and new life and courage was about to begin. Joseph just watched Jesus die. He had been afraid of being excommunicated, but somehow the moment he saw Jesus die, he decided there are worse things than being put out of the synagogue. There are worse things than being despised. There are worse things than being overlooked. And at that moment, he still had fear, but he chose courage. See, there's something that happens at the cross. There is something that happens when we are willing to stand in that place and see who he is and what he has done for us, where we stop giving fear control and we decide, you know what? I've chosen fear enough days. I'm going to choose courage today. Guys, how many days have we chosen fear? And you may say, I've never chosen it. I just felt it. But what did you do with it? Right? That's the question. None of us chose to feel it, but a lot of us have chosen to surrender to it. I know I have way too many times. See, the cross is not simply where Jesus died. It's where Jesus killed sin and everything that came along with it. At the cross, our sin was paid for and our fears were dealt with. Think about it for a moment. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says that Jesus became sin. That means that when Jesus died, he died as sin. If he became sin, what died with him? What did he die as? As sin. Sin died at the cross, but so can fear and shame, anxiety and insecurity, arrogance and selfishness, self-preservation and personal opinions. At the cross, everything that doesn't exist in heaven was put to death on earth the cross killed some stuff that we don't have to live with any longer but we have to decide to pick up the things that came to life after the cross let's join joseph and nicodemus let's take courage and even if we still feel fear let's stop choose to stop living in fear Mark didn't say that Joseph stopped being afraid. He said that Joseph started to choose courage. Are we? Maybe the better question is, will we? There are some things that you're facing that probably are stirring a whole lot of questions. Will we choose courage? There are some things that we're going to face that will stir a lot of questions. Will we choose courage or will we slip back into all of those familiar emotions? We have the ability to choose courage. We have the opportunity to choose courage, even if we can't figure out how to stop feeling fear. We can choose faith. John says that these two men took Jesus' body, that they wrapped it in strips of linen with the customary burial spices, and then they quickly laid Jesus in a tomb owned by Joseph that had never been used before. This fulfilled yet another prophecy. Isaiah 53 verse 9 says that the Messiah would die with the wicked but be buried among the rich. That's now our sixth fulfilled prophecy between the time that Jesus got to the cross and this point where he's taken off of the cross. We know literally nothing about what happened over those next two days. There is nothing written in any of the Gospels about the time between Jesus being laid in the tomb and his resurrection from the dead. There are some historical thoughts. There are some traditional ideas. But scripturally, it seems like he was laid in the tomb and the whole world stopped until he rose from the dead. Which, I'll be real honest, that's exactly the way it should be. We don't need to know anything in the in-between. We just need to know that he died for us and then he rose so that we can rise with him. John 20 begins by telling us that early on Sunday morning before the sun rose that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and when she got there she saw that the stone had been removed. Now some of the other gospels give us more details. John doesn't tell us any other details of what Mary might have seen or done only that she ran to Peter and John and she said to them they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. 
Briefly, Mary's words fill in one of the blanks from John's account of the story. In the other Gospels, it tells us that it was Mary and a group of women that went to the tomb. While John only mentions Mary, but he, she says here, we do not know where they have laid, her, laid him. So the use of the word we shows that she was not the only one there. But what we do see is that Mary was afraid, she was upset, and I don't believe it's a stretch to say that she was a bit panicked. But notice this. Mary's first thought was not, Jesus did what he said he would do. Mary's first thought was, he rose. Mary's first thought was, her greatest fear. They took him. Guys, sometimes people will tell you to trust your gut, that your first answer is always the right answer. Man, sometimes you got to think things through and remember what you've been told that you haven't remembered because a lot of times our first feeling is an old feeling, it's a familiar feeling, and it's not a feeling that we should run with any longer. And so I don't say this judgmentally, but when Mary got there and saw the tomb empty, it didn't even cross her mind to start praising or rejoicing. Instead, she started worrying and, and panicking. And I do the same thing so many times. Where God starts doing what he said he would do, but I forgot that it's going to be different than I wanted it to be. And so my first thought is to panic. My first thought is to fear. My first thought is to complain. My first thought is to tell somebody about it or to go to a familiar action or a familiar response. And what the scriptures are trying to teach us is move past your first thought. Stop reacting and start thinking back to what he said. Mary saw the greatest thing she would ever see in her life, and it caused fear instead of joy. How many times have you and I done that? Where the thing that God does for us is exactly what we've been asking him to do, but it's a little scary when it happens. And so we go to those familiar places rather than pushing through to those faithful places. John says that both he and Peter ran together toward the tomb, and John got there first. That he looked inside and he saw the linen clothes lying there, which the language here means that they had been placed upon Jesus, but they were laying exactly as if Jesus had risen out of them without any of them being disturbed. They weren't all over the place like Lazarus's was when, were when someone had to help him. They were laid there like he had handled them himself. And it says this, John didn't go in. So why didn't he? Why didn't John go in the empty tomb? And I don't ask that in judgment. It's just something that I've always wondered about. Here's John, the disciple Jesus loved. Here's John, the one who had been at the cross. He had welcomed Mary into his home. He was the one disciple that had stayed as close as he could to Jesus during the suffering. But when he got to the empty tomb, he stayed outside. Why? What keeps any of us from running right up to the edge of change? but then not taking the last step. And I know this is conjecture, but I'm talking more about things I've experienced. I don't know why John didn't go in, but maybe he didn't go in because he was afraid. I can tell you honestly that going into a tomb to see if a body was still in there or not is something that I'd be afraid of. Maybe it was a respect issue. He didn't feel he was worthy to enter into his Lord's empty tomb. Maybe it was tradition. Maybe the fear of breaking the law, becoming ceremonially unclean because of the presence of a dead body. Why didn't John go in? We don't know. But what we can be sure of is that John wanted to go in. He wanted to see if Jesus was there. He wanted to know what had happened. But something seemed to paralyze him at the very last step. Many of us are on the threshold of an empty tomb. We are one step away from the change that we've hoped for and prayed for, even the change that we've dreamed about. But that last step is always the longest and the hardest one to take. We've thought about it and talked about it. We've planned for it, but now we have to actually do it. And when we are afraid it won't work, that we'll be disappointed, or even worse, that we'll become a disappointment, we stand on the edge and then start slowly backing away. Some of us don't even realize how comfortable we've gotten living a life that we know is less than the one that God prepared for us. We want things to change. We just don't want to be the thing that gets changed. And so we sabotage ourselves. We shrink back at the last moment. We make an excuse. We re return to an old behavior. Or worst of all, we just stand there and let shame tell us that we have failed again and that we're always going to fail. 
We find ourselves standing one step short of where we want to be, but even more, one step short of where we were meant to be. Why won't we take that last step? Guys, I'm asking you to search your own heart and to search your own life. Why won't you take the last step? I'm not talking about destiny. I'm talking about obedience. I'm not talking about being on the step, of the, 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 the threshold of greatness. I'm talking about being on the threshold of faithfulness, of obedience, of transformation, of being made in the image of Jesus. Why do we give in every time we get close and those old habits come back? Every time that we feel God doing something and we also feel ourselves feeling sorry for ourselves or being angry about something or being disappointed in something. Why do we run to things that cannot soothe us? Why do we get to the edge? And then we wait. Waiting to see if it might happen for us. Here's the thing. You're never going to know what's inside unless you go in yourself. You're never going to see the empty tomb unless you stick your head in there and go find out for yourself. It's not going to happen for you. Forgive me if this is personal because I don't mean it to be personal to anyone, but you're not going to just wake up one day and get sober. You're not going to wake up one day and not be anxious. You're not going to wake up one day and not be lusting. You're not going to wake up one day and not be disappointed. It's not going to happen. You have to take a step of faith in the middle of all those things and believe that if I will trust God, he will do in me and he will do for me what he what I can not do in and for myself and so instead of us waiting for it to happen go watch him do it while you walk through it and be less critical of your failures because at least you're trying be less critical be less afraid of doing it wrong and know that grace covers those things. That's why his rod and his staff, they comfort us. What do they do? The rod fights off the enemies. The staff corrects us in our wrongness. So here's the thing. If you're wrong, he will let you know. And if you have an enemy, he will fight it off. But you and I have got to take the next step. While John was standing there, Peter arrived and went right into the tomb. Now, we, we, here's your thought. Of course he did. He's Peter, right? Peter's the one who always spoke without thinking, did without thinking. Peter's the one that he got, he got rewarded for a faith, and he got rebuked for doing too much. So, of course, Peter did. He arrived. He went right in. He saw the cloths for himself. He saw the handkerchief that had been covering Jesus' face, that it was folded and set aside by itself. He saw that the tomb was empty and that Jesus was not there. And as much as I have wondered about why Pete John didn't go in the tomb, I have no doubts about why Peter went in. It was not because he was brash, and it was not because he was impetuous or even that he was suddenly courageous. Peter went in the tomb because more than anybody else, Peter needed the tomb to be empty. Peter needed Jesus to be alive. The last time Peter and Jesus had locked eyes was right after Peter had denied Jesus for the third time. Luke twenty two sixty one 61 says, The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And Peter wept bitterly. If Jesus were dead, Peter was nothing more than a denier. He was someone who fought for Jesus when he wanted to, but then denied him when it became difficult. Peter needed the tomb to be empty. He knew he couldn't be free unless Jesus was alive. See, the cross is where our sin was paid for. It's where our enemies were defeated. But it's in the tomb where new life begins. And many of us are living at the cross and we need to be like Peter and run to the tomb. How sad it is to be free but live in bondage. To be paid for but to live in poverty. To be loved but to despise ourselves. Don't just hope for a new life or even pray for a new life. Run to a new life. Romans chapter 11, excuse me, Romans chapter 8 verses 11 through 13 tell us, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, what does therefore mean? The next thing doesn't matter unless we understand the last thing. So therefore, 
We have an obligation. So because the Spirit lives in you, you now have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh. It is not to the sinful nature. It is an obligation to live differently. It is an obligation to take steps of faith. An obligation to believe the Word of God. An obligation to trust the character of God. You don't have an obligation to your feelings. You don't have an obligation to your past. You don't have an obligation to your mindset, your opinions, your traditions, or your family. The only obligation you have is to the Spirit spirit who lives in you and that obligation is to trust him and we trust him when we follow him when we obey him so many of us are bound up in obligations that we've been freed from we keep serving stuff that's gone we keep honestly we keep conjuring things that died at the cross We keep bringing up opinions and beliefs and past experiences and ideas and we keep bringing it up and bringing it up and we talk about it like it's still there. It's not there. Stop trying to be delivered from something that's been killed. Stop trying to get healing from something that's been put away. Stop trying to find the root of something that's actually died and go forward into what's actually living right now. The Spirit of God who lives within you. There is a point where we have to acknowledge that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So go be free. And yet we keep wrapping ourselves in it. Stop blaming the devil and blame you. Because it's you and me that keep letting those feelings have their room, have control. We keep letting those thoughts take over. We like it more than we want to admit it. We have got to learn to be free because we have been set free. Take the chance to be free. Take bold steps of faith. Do things differently. Let go of control. Embrace discomfort. Stop waiting for God to do something that he's already done. Your new life is prepared for you. The only thing that is missing from it is you. So run from the cross to the tomb so you can walk in newness of life. Because there's no way to walk in what's new until we've run away from what's old. Be afraid, but choose courage. And take the next step, because the next step is the last step. It's the one that changes everything. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15 says, One died for all, and he died that we would live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised. Jesus died so that we would live differently than we've ever lived before. We have to learn how to stop soothing ourselves with our addictions and stop protecting ourselves with our uh, possessions, to stop feeling or fulfilling ourselves with our traditions, and to stop comforting ourselves with inferior things and make new choices. You cannot walk in new life until you make new choices. And yet, again, we keep wanting to figure out how to mesh them together, right? How to make them work. Have you figured out, those of you who have been married a long time, like Melissa and I have been married 25 years, and it has been 25 years of blessing that has come through 25 years of hard work. And and I'll be honest, she's had to work a lot harder than I have. But, the you know, we love this whole idea of, you know, in marriage, the two become one. It's a miracle. When it happens, it's a miracle. It's another one of those things like sanctification. It is a spiritual truth that takes a long time to become an actual reality. And so God looks at us as one, but a lot of times we're not living as one. You know why? Because we're trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out how to get my 100% to fit into hers. And as far as I'm concerned, she's got some stuff she could let go of. Right? Like, you know, there's just some things. Her, my mother-in-law's here. I love you. There's some things her parents should have done differently. There's some things that if she would have, you know, if she would have been raised a little better, maybe she'd understand. And she's thinking the same thing about me. She's thinking the same thing about my upbringing. And we're trying to figure out how do we get all of our stuff together in one space? And here's the truth of two becoming one. It's not until you both stop being what you've been. It's not until you both lay down. It's not when we all, all of a sudden, when we divvy it up and where Melissa says, you know what, okay, I don't need that, I don't need that. You you let me keep this and I'll let you keep that other thing. And suddenly we figure out how to fill up the storage space of our hearts. The reality is it's when we both decide that the other is more important than I am. 
It's when we both decide that I love you more than I love myself. It's when we both decide that this thing is not about me getting what I want. It's about me being what you need. And so I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to serve you the way that Christ has served me. And when we do that, suddenly the two become one because the two don't exist anymore. And it's one brand new being that comes up out of it. So many of our marriage issues are because we're still trying to figure out how to get two dead things together into one living thing, and it just doesn't happen. And yet it's the way that most of us are living, not just our marriages, it's how we're living most of our lives. We're trying to figure out how to redeem the unredeemable. We're trying to figure out how to just hang on to a little bit of it and make it a little bit better. And the reality is there's nothing better to be present. We have to stop letting our past dictate our future. We have to choose to walk in newness of life. When you live in your past, when you let those familiar feelings have control, it robs you of your present. We have to stop letting familiar feelings keep us from the fullness of life. Jesus did not die so that we could go to heaven. He died so that he could use us to bring heaven to earth. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have to leave all the old at the cross and run to the new life that Jesus has given us. But it doesn't happen unless we're willing to enter into something brand new. Something scary, something that we've never seen before, something we've never wanted before, if we're going to be real honest about things. New life is not better life. It's literally new life. It's where the old has passed away. Right? We love 2 Corinthians 5. I am a new creation. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. So that just leads me to ask you one question. Have all things passed away? Because stop telling me that all your things are new when you're still walking around thinking like you always thought, talking like you always thought, and relating to others the way you always did. You don't get to announce your new life unless you've been willing to lay down your old one. There is a dual work that happens. And as we lay down the old, he is faithful to provide us with the new. Scripture tells us that after Peter went in, that John followed him, and then he wrote about himself that he saw and he believed. There's such beauty in this. We have no idea how many people will follow us into faith if we will simply have the courage to take the first step. I don't know why John didn't go in, but he waited for Peter. And once Peter walked in faith, John didn't wait any longer. He saw what Peter had done. He saw where Peter had gone, and he followed Peter, and he believed in Jesus. What if the people you and I are worried about their opinions are just waiting for someone to take a step of faith so that they could follow us into that same place? We are so worried about what our family will think or what our bosses will think or our friends will think or even our spouses will think. What if they are the Johns in our lives and if we will take that step of faith, they are ready to go. They just need somebody to lead them. What if there's nothing to worry about at all? (laughs) And I don't mean what if everything's going to go well. I just mean this honestly. What if there's nothing to worry about at all? John then says that they went back to their houses, but Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. Mary wasn't ready to leave. Now Mary Magdalene was not an apostle, but she was one of Jesus' most faithful disciples. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, tells us that when Jesus met Mary, that he cast seven demons out of her, and that she became a part of a small group of women that followed Jesus along with the twelve apostles and provided for the needs of the ministry. She was one of the women at the cross, and she was one of, if not the first person at the tomb. She loved Jesus, she believed in Jesus, she followed Jesus. Scripture says that Mary was crying, weeping it says. If you go to the Greek language, what it literally says is that she was sobbing and wailing. Mary was overcome with grief. To the point where when she looked into the tomb, she saw two angels and they asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? So imagine this. Mary is uncontrollable and unconsolable at the same time. And she had to stoop down because it's not like this giant thing we see where there's this big, two, big, this big stone that's rolled away. It was dug out. So she would have had to stoop down to look in. And when she looks in, she sees an angel sitting where Jesus' head should have been. And she sees an angel sitting where Jesus' feet would have been. And she just kept weeping. And she just kept wailing. And so the angels say to her, woman, why are you weeping? 
And Mary answers and says, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Think about this. Mary saw angels in Jesus' empty tomb and still thought Jesus' body had been stolen. Now, we can, we can laugh at Mary because we can see ourselves, right? Because there's been a lot of times in our own lives where Jesus just did a miracle and we're still crying because we think everything fell apart. Because she, her mind was so made up, her, her opinion was so set, her emotions were so in control that when she saw evidence of a miracle, she didn't even notice it because her, she'd already set her mind on what she believed had happened. Why do negative emotions make us so stubborn? Why do we decide that our narrative is the narrative even when people can show us that our narrative is the wrong one? The angels were sitting in Jesus' grave next to his unmoved grave clothes and asked her, why are you crying? And she still felt it was important to explain to them her theory, her assumption, and her opinion. She was witnessing a miracle, but was still completely controlled by her feelings. They were trying to give her good news, but she just kept repeating her fears about bad news. Mary would not allow them to correct her because she was convinced that she was already correct. Stubbornness will make you miss some miracles. Stubbornness will keep you from some things that God has prepared for you. Please stop thinking stubbornness is the same as faithfulness. It is not. Faithfulness is doing what you're called to. Stubbornness is holding on what you want for yourself. One of them is humble. The other one is proud. One of them is surrendered. The other one is controlling. Don't allow stubbornness to have a place in your life. I come from a family that that believes in the pride of stubbornness. I come from a family that stubbornness might be on our family crest. That when you gather at a family reunion, it won't be long while someone's arguing with someone else and all you'll end up hearing is, well, you know how stubborn us Kaliniches are. Like it's a badge of courage. How many miracles have we missed? How many open doors have we refused to walk through? How many opportunities have we failed at? Have we just handed off? Because we know what's right. We know what's happening. We know the way things should be done. And I want us to feel for Mary and her brokenness, but don't miss what's really going on. She is stubborn in her brokenness. She is stubborn about her grief. She is feeling it with all of her force. Some of us are blinded by our opinions and our assumptions and even our concerns. It is said that 90% of the things we worry about never happen, and yet we continue to worry. I have to go back to the cross here for a minute. It is finished. It's not only the end of our fears and the beginning of our new life. It has to be the end of our opinions and our theories, our assumptions and our expectations, our definitions and our ideas about how things have been, will be, or should be. We've got to lay all that stuff down at the cross. You don't get to carry your dreams with you from the cross to the tomb. We don't get to carry our anxieties with us. We don't get to carry how sheltered we were, how many things we avoided, the way that our lives were ordered to make sure that they were the way that they were supposed to be. All that stuff has to stay at the cross because all that stuff is the old life and it is not welcome in the new one. Walking in newness of life requires that we stop living our old lives. Let's let go of the mindsets and the habits that got you to the cross so that the cross can take you to places you've never been before. The cross takes us to hope and to joy, to peace and to freedom, to forgiveness and to security, to transformation, to new life and to abundant life. But let me tell you this, those things are not things you get to define for yourself. Those are things you need to hear from about by those who live around you. Don't start telling me that you're living with peace, ask the people around you if they see peace. Don't tell me you're living with joy. Ask the people who live with you, do you see joy in me? Because we lie to ourselves and we deceive ourselves and we start thinking that we are where we're supposed to be. But it's the people who experience us that can say, you're just as anxious as I am. You're just as fearful as you always were. Because some of us, forgive me for a minute, some of us come here and we lift our hands and we sing our songs and we get our goosebumps and we've decided that that's joy and peace and life in the Holy Ghost. And it's not. For some of us, for some of us, it's a mirage in the middle of the desert. For some of us, it's how we fool ourselves into thinking that we're fully surrendered because we've got these feelings. And the reality is it's not feelings that need to change. It's our hearts. And it's our lives, and it is everything about us. So one of the things I want to encourage you in tonight is the people that you love the most and that love you the most, start asking them what they see in you. 
Have honest conversations. Sit down, husbands and wives. Sit down, parents and children, and have honest conversations where you can say, what is it that you see in me? When things are hard, what do you see as my response? Because we don't know. But we've been given people that will tell us the truth. And the truth will set us free if we'll believe it and respond to it. Mary was filled with fear even when she was staring at the greatest miracle anyone had ever seen. See, how many of us would like to not only have our sins forgiven, but to be free from our worries and our fears? How many of us would like to be free from our anxiety and pressure, from our stress and our shame, from our feelings of impending doom and secret beliefs that we just aren't good enough? How many of us would like to be free of the fear of doing the wrong thing, being unwanted, unloved, or simply left alone? But the only way to be free is to be different. We can't do the same things, believe the same things, talk about the same things, and prepare for the same things, and expect to have different lives. And so it's not about, Lord, take these feelings from me. It's about, give me the courage to be obedient in the middle of the feelings. When the angel said, why are you weeping? They were trying to get her to see that there was nothing to weep about. Her opinion was wrong. What she thought had happened did not happen. Her fears were not coming true. But she had to stop telling them what she thought and hear them tell her something new. She had to learn a new truth, but she wasn't going to learn it until she stopped telling her old lies. Mary could not believe that Jesus was alive until she stopped living in the grief of Jesus' death. She could not hear their voices until she quieted hers. There are some of us that can't hear what God's saying because we keep telling God what's happening. There are a reason why James tells us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Because there is far more we need to hear than there is things that we need to say. After she answered the angels, basically disregarding their presence and their question, she turned around and Scripture says she saw Jesus, only she didn't know it was Jesus. She thought he was the gardener. And so Jesus asks her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? So he repeated the same question, right? He's trying to get her to see something is going on here that you're not paying attention to. Repeated questions are a form of God's correction. If you keep hearing similar questions, you might need to start questioning your answers. He did it with Elijah. Remember in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah had run and run and run. And finally, after 40 days of running, he gets to the presence of God. And God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah has his speech. And he goes through it and he says, I am the only one left. I am tired of doing this. No one else is obedient. It's just me and I'm ready to die. And So God allows Elijah to experience his presence. God shows him his presence in a still, small voice. And then after seeing God's presence, Elijah said, God says to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? Same question. And Elijah, being the stubborn prophet that he was, gives the exact same speech. And God doesn't even respond to it. Other than to say, I have 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. You are not alone. Go do what you're called to do. Go and anoint the next king. Go and anoint the next prophet. Go and be who you're called to be and stop letting what you're afraid of get in the way of your identity. Second question for Mary Magdalene is the same question she had heard at first because she wasn't listening to the answer. She was just offering her opinion. She held her ground. She believed her opinion. She was not ready to be corrected. And so Mary answers and she says to Jesus, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Mary refused to believe anything other than what she had already decided was true. Jesus was dead and the tomb was empty because his body had been stolen. She couldn't hear anything other than that. Her mind was made up. Her ears were turned off. Her heart was hardened and she was right. Except she wasn't. What if I were to tell you tonight that you're just not right? I'll be nice. I won't say you're wrong. I'll just say you're not right. 
What if the very things that we keep putting in front of ourselves, the very things we keep worrying about, fearing about, and giving room to, they're not even correct. They're not even, I don't want to say they're not real, they're just not what God's In Luke 24, there were two disciples of Jesus who were in a similar position to Mary. Jesus had died, and they were grieving. They were angry. They were disappointed. And so they decided to just leave Jerusalem and walk to Emmaus. As they walked, they were talking about everything that had happened. They talked about Jesus' arrest, his trial, his suffering, and his death. And as they were talking, Jesus drew near to them. But just like Mary, they didn't recognize him. And so Jesus asked them what they were talking about, and here's the key, and why they were sad. So it's not just Jesus is saying, what is this you're talking about? Jesus wants to know, why is your countenance this way? Why have you chosen this to be what you walk in? Did you know that just because you feel it doesn't mean you have to walk in it? Something I'm trying to learn, something I'm trying to choose to wrestle with. But just because you wake up feeling a certain way doesn't mean that's got to be the way that you live. Doesn't mean it's got to be the way that you act. I'm going to be honest, I wake up some days irritated. It doesn't mean that my family should have to suffer under my irritation all day. There are days that I wake up and for no reason that anybody can explain, I may feel melancholy. It doesn't mean I have to live in depression all day. Just because I feel it doesn't mean I have to walk in it. There's a point where we have to start dealing with our feelings according to the truth we know rather than the things that we feel. And so Jesus addresses these apostles and these disciples, excuse me, and he says to them, what are you talking about and why are you so sad? They were surprised. I think they were even a little bit offended that he hadn't heard about what had happened to Jesus. Almost like they're asking him, are you, have you been living under a rock? Where is it that you've been that you don't know everything that happened to Jesus of Nazareth over this last few days? They explain everything to Jesus, and then they say this to him. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Basically, they were expressing that their hopes had been dashed at Jesus' death. And the scripture says Jesus rebuked them. He walked with them. He taught them from the scriptures that the Messiah had to suffer, die, and then rise again. And then they finally recognized him. Sometimes our expectations and our opinions, our demands and our past experiences keep us from seeing who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing. Sometimes we're blinded to the truth because we've already decided we know what we need to know. Ever try to tell somebody something? Parents, I know you've had this happen. Try to tell your kids something and before you're done telling them, they explain to you why you're wrong. Or they jump in with an answer to the thing that you're just trying to help with. That there's something, you've been there, you've seen it, and you try to be kind, but they just, like, all the kindness you try, they just, like, squeeze it out of your body somehow. Because immediately they just answer you real quick. Listen to me, guys. Quick answers show there's been little listening. If someone has something to say to you and you immediately have a response, you haven't heard what they've actually said to you. Start looking at your own life. If you answer everybody quickly, it's because you believe you already know better. Man, you can't, you, can't be, you can't be changed that way. You can't be taught that way. You can't be transformed that way. Maybe, worst of all, you can't be used that way. What if the thing you and I are fighting against is the very thing that Jesus is trying to do? What if the thing you keep asking Jesus to change is the thing he's designed to change us? What if the only thing in your way is you? Are we willing to be corrected? Are we willing to let go? Are we willing to walk in newness of life with new steps of faith, new definitions of success, new beliefs about ourselves, and no more opinions, just truth from God's word as it's taught to us by God's spirit? If it is finished, we must stop carrying it with us, or we will never get from the cross to the tomb. We will live in the grief of Jesus' death rather than the joy of his resurrection. Mary would not let go of her thinking. She would not let go of her opinion. She would not listen. She was quick to give answers rather than to think through questions. And finally, Jesus interrupted her with a simple word. He called her name. He said, Mary. And I don't believe he was aggravated, and I don't believe he was angry, but I do believe he spoke with authority because I do believe he was calling her name to get her to be quiet. Mary, enough. Stop. Hear me, listen to me, slow down enough that you can recognize me. Guys, sometimes God's calling our name not because it's this, you know, tender moment that he wants us to have with him. He's trying to get us to be quiet and listen to what he has to say. Sometimes our lives, we run into these brick walls and it's all it is is God saying, A, B, enough. 
because my way hasn't gotten me to his plan yet. But his plan has never failed me. There have been so many parts of my life that I did not understand what he was doing, but now I see that he was good. There are things in my life that have shaped me to be who I am, but I would never re repeat them if I had the choice because I thought they were bad things when they were happening. But the reality is without those things, I wouldn't be who I am and he wouldn't be having his way in my life. And so how could they be bad things? They were hard things. They were difficult things, but they were his things. And so please don't read this and hear Jesus softly whispering her name. He's not because she's not paying any attention. And so he raises his voice in authority, again, not in anger. But I think that he knew that the only way that she was going to slow down was not if he comforted her, but if he corrected her. She needed to stop giving her opinion if she was ever going to hear his truth. If she was not going to stop giving a voice to her fear and anxiety, she was never going to hear Jesus' voice. So he called her by name. Guys, tonight, and we're coming to a close, but tonight, if we don't stop giving a voice and telling the stories of our anxiety and our shame and our brokenness and our worries and our what-ifs and the last time I was around someone like that or the last time something like this happened, if we don't stop giving voice to those things, we are never going to hear what Jesus is trying to say and we are never going to be what we were created to be because we're just going to keep walking in circles, round and round, but walls are never going to fall because we're walking according to our understanding, not God's authority. And so I'm going to tell you this, as mean as it sounds, stop telling your old stories and start declaring God's work and his faith and his character and his word. Stop telling me what happened the last time and start believing what God says can happen this time. Let's stop carrying with us stuff that Jesus disposed of. Let's stop conjuring stuff that the cross put to death. Jesus called her name and Mary just simply said Rabboni, which simply means teacher. Real quickly, Mary must have fallen down and grabbed Jesus around his feet because he said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. There are a lot of theories about what this means and about you know, glorified bodies and all this stuff. And I'm going to be real honest with you, that none of it holds a whole lot of water because it doesn't make any sense in the context. It doesn't make any sense in the narrative. It doesn't make any sense in the relationship. And so here's what I believe was happening. Jesus was speaking to the fearful part of Mary, the grieving part, the anxious part, the part that was afraid of losing him again, the part that wouldn't walk in newness of life because she was afraid it wouldn't be as good as walking with him in the former way that they had. I believe Mary fell down and held him around the ankles, not because she was glad to see him, but because she was afraid he was going to go away again, that she was trying to cling to something old when he was trying to do something new, that she wanted a familiar relationship and he wanted to transform that relationship relationship because he had already said it is better for you that I go to the father and so he would not let her stay in an old familiar relationship that was less productive than the new uncomfortable relationship and so I don't believe it had anything to do with his physical body or his glorified body it was the condition and the state of their relationship and of Mary's anxious heart she was holding on to the relationship that they had had in the past, and Jesus was trying to lead her into a new relationship, a deeper one, even a better one. And so my encouragement tonight is to let go of what you've had so that you can have what Jesus has planned for you. Enjoy where you are. Give thanks for where you've been, but run toward newness of life. Let's not get caught up in how we want things, how we need things, or even how we think things should be. And let's let Jesus do what he desires, what we need, and what he knows is best. The empty tomb is a symbol of new life, but it's also an announcement that the old life is gone. Are we willing to let go of all that has been so that we can grab hold of all that will be? Are we willing to finally step over the threshold of the tomb and walk in the power of the resurrection? Are we willing to stop telling him what we think and start listening to what he says? Are we willing to live new lives by leaving our old lives at the cross? See, I believe this. It's time to stop weeping and stop worrying, stop doubting and start running.
There is a new life in Jesus, but we must give our old lives to Jesus. If we are ever going to live with him, for him, and like him, we have to stop living the way we've always lived before. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back and prepare to finish us out tonight. But as they go, I'm just going to tell you a little story of my own as they come. And I'm sorry, guys, everything's moved, so we'll figure it out. I have spent every Thanksgiving of my life, 47 Thanksgivings, in Virginia at my parents' table. Every single one of them. Even ones I didn't want to spend there, I spent there. And this year, everything was different, right? But here's what I realized as I started praying. Thanksgiving was my dad's favorite holiday. It was the one that meant the most to him, and it was all for him. It was just all about faith, and it was all about family. He could care less about football. Um, He really, really liked his food. But the thing he loved about Thanksgiving was that we were all there. It was the one time we were all there. In fact, my dad's last Thanksgiving was um, 2016, and he knew he was sick. And in fact, he told us as a family that it would probably be his last Thanksgiving. And so he made sure everybody was there. They made sure my nephew came in from out of state, and they got everybody there. He got himself up and dressed and cleaned up and had a photographer come over and take pictures of the family. And he smiled as much as he could smile and ate as much as he could eat. And then he slept for the next day and a half. He just conjured every bit of strength he had for that day because he knew it was the last one that he was going to spend with us. And he was right. He died the next May. The next Thanksgiving was awful. Some of you have had that Thanksgiving, so you know what I'm talking about. The next Thanksgiving, we were in his house. We were on his day trying to do his stuff, his way, but he wasn't there. And so it just felt empty. And for the first time in my life, Thanksgiving was miserable. The next year, we decided, let's change things up a little bit. We have to keep having Thanksgiving because it was Dad's favorite holiday. So let's go to Virginia, and we'll do things a little different. And we went to church in the morning, and we had Thanksgiving with some cousins, and we did this, and we did that, and came home and felt like, ah, this isn't what it was supposed to be. Last Thanksgiving, we went back to Virginia and did what we always had done, and we went to church together, and then we went to my brother's house, and we sat around, and we tried to eat the stuff we're supposed to eat and talk about the things we'd always talked about, and it just didn't feel right, so much so that I told my mom before we left, I said, Mom, this is going to be the last Thanksgiving we spend down here. It's time for us to do something new, which sounded like a great idea because it was my idea, but then COVID comes. And I can't go down there. If I change my mind at the last minute and decide, you know what, I don't want my mom to be alone. Suddenly, I can't do that. And it became no longer such a great idea. It became something thrust upon me. Something I did not want to do anymore. And yet God just kept reminding me. This decision, you made this decision long before it was made for you. I'd already spoken to you about this long before any of this was going on, which is just his grace and just his mercy. But you know what, as we planned for this Thanksgiving, a new Thanksgiving, God really started to speak to my heart about something. And that was the reason the last few years were so hard was not because my dad was gone, but because we were trying to keep something alive that was finished. Because we were still trying to have a Thanksgiving that would have pleased him when he was no longer there to be pleased. That we were still trying to recapture something old rather than walking into something new. And I'm going to be real honest with you. This Thanksgiving is one of the best Thanksgivings of my life. That we got to do it in a different place and in a different way and with different people. And I got to feel and experience the presence of God and the goodness of God. And rather than it being a day of mourning, it became a day of Thanksgiving again. Brand new. And guys, there are some things in your life that will not become brand new until you let the old things be buried. And I don't know what those are, and it may be way more serious than Thanksgiving. But I want to encourage you and even challenge you tonight. Stop telling God your old story and let him speak to you his new plan. Because he rescued you from the old so that he could deliver you into something new. Tonight, I'm just asking the worship team to come back, and they're going to sing Refiner, because this is all a heart issue. This is all about trusting our hearts to God, and it's about, and forgive me for some of this, but it is about to no longer to stop telling the stories, to stop living in the past, to stop remembering all of those moments, to stop thinking that we have to hold on to things that are accomplished and finished. And so tonight, I'm just going to ask you, 
when they start to sing, would you just close yourself up with Jesus and give him whatever parts of your heart have remained hidden and have remained hurt and have remained the focus of your life. Because my prayer is that we'll walk out of this place tonight making decisions, probably feeling the same as we felt, but making decisions that say, you know what? I'm going to walk in newness of life. I'm going to live a new life. I'm going to make some new decisions and I'm going to tell some new stories and I'm going to do things a new way. I'm going to leave the old where it was. I'm not bringing the new, those old traditions and those old beliefs and those old feelings into the, my new relationships and into my new house and into my new job and into my new car and into my new anything I'm going into, into our new church experience, into our new facility, our new place that we've been invited, into our new partnerships. We're not bringing any of that with us. Not because it was bad, but because it's finished. And let's walk in newness of life. Can we just take a few minutes? And if you feel to sing, sing. If you feel to pray, pray. If you feel to sit in silence, sit in silence. If you need to weep something out, weep it out. But let's give him the stuff we've been keeping. Yes. So that we can go from the old to the new. To never go on. The altars where you meet us. Take me there, take me there. If what you need is just an offering, it's right here. My life is here, and I'll be.
Father, whatever you desire, that's what we desire to be. Whatever you have planned, that's what we want. For whatever reason you created us, that's all we want to walk in. And so tonight, God, I pray that you would forgive us where there is unforgiven sin. I pray that you would cleanse us where there is unresolved issues. And I pray that you would strengthen us, that we would be a people who go forward, that we would be a people who don't just talk about new life, but who walk in it, who run to it, who live in such a way that we reveal it to those around us. And so tonight, God, I pray for all of my friends that are here in the room and that are watching. And I ask that you would just search us and know our hearts. I ask that you would show us an honest evaluation of who we are. And forgive us for all the times where we correct you. For all of the times where we hold it against you. For all of the times where we hold on to what we want to be. Instead of trusting in who you are and who you've made us to be. And so tonight, have your way. Have your way, have your way, have your way. I put my life at your feet. I put my past at your feet, my opinions, my ideas, my wants, my dreams. I put it all at your feet, God. And I ask, don't let me come one step short any longer. Don't let me be the one who stands on the edge any longer. Give me the courage to take a step of faith. And to believe that if I fall, you will catch me. If I'm wrong, you will correct me. But if I'm where you want me to be, you will empower me. And you will do in me and you will do through me more than I could ever ask or imagine for myself. And so tonight, Jesus, have your way. Transform us. Change us. Lead us into newness of life. Bring us to that edge like you brought Mary and John. But may we be those who decide to take that step to walk in like Peter. And may we never be the same again. May we live in newness. May we live for newness. And may we live from newness. I pray that tonight would be a night where everything begins again. And where we would not carry the old and we would not resemble the old. But we would decide from this day on, I will probably feel some things I felt before. And I will probably go through some stuff I've gone through before. But I am going to be brand new. And I am going to live a new life. Because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me. And if he can raise him from death, he can raise me to life. And so I pray, God, that as a people, may we be a body, may we be a group that devote ourselves to your word and to your people and to your presence. May we be a people who walk by faith and not by sight. May we be a people who are quick to listen and slow to speak. May we be a people who are brand new. May we be a people whom you, they could say of us that we are those who turn the world upside down because we are those who stop living right side up. We love you and we thank you. Have your way and be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you have a prayer need, if you'd like someone to reach out to you, would you just share your email address with us? Let us know if there's something going on that we can walk with you through or stand with you in. Please send us a message. Leave us a comment. We would love to be able to help you take those new steps of new life. For those of you who are here with us, thank you so much for being here tonight. God bless you guys. Look forward um, to seeing you on Wednesday for Bible study and then back together again next Saturday. God bless you.